My name is Jason. My name is Tom. And this is Fear of a Black Dragon, an old school RPG podcast. And in this episode, after years of smashing boundaries, we've finally hit our century. It's episode 100! That's right, listeners, this is episode 100 of Fear of a Black Dragon. It's taken us a long time to get here, but we are here. We're going to do a special episode to celebrate our 100th episode. And so Tom and I are going to be talking a little bit about our reflections on the show, making the show for, I guess, like, what, seven years Six now? Or seven or something? Years. It's a Six lot. Six or seven, yeah, yeah it's yeah. a lot. And how we think the show has affected us, uh, influenced the community, and so forth. Then we're going to swing over and talk about our top five modules. We are each going to reveal our top five list of modules. That's something people ask us all the time. And so today we're going to tell them. And then we're going to wrap up with listener questions. We asked for listeners to send us questions to talk about on this special episode. And we're going to do that. Yeah, we got uh, episode 100 and we're going to answer 100 or fewer questions. So Indeed, (laughs) indeed. So let's talk about Fear of a Black Dragon at episode 100. We move at a slow pace, putting out new episodes. That is probably because we play the things we talk about, which I think puts a natural cap on how often we can meet and record things. Mm -hmm. But I think that the show is better for it. So it's taken us a while to get here. But I do think because of that, we've got to see a pretty good little slice of the hobby, six or seven years of the development of the hobby and how the community has changed, how role-playing games have changed. And I think it's fairly safe to say that at this point, after 100 episodes, that Fear of a Black Dragon has been a pretty big influence on how the scene has changed. What are your thoughts on that? I'm not sure how much credit we can claim for (laughs) the changes that we have seen, but uh, uh, we've definitely been an influence on some people. Like we've seen, well, I've I've had people say to me, like they've sort of got ideas from things we talked about, or uh, even not just from us directly, but the fact that we discussed uh, a particular module or a particular game concept in an episode then gave them this sort of idea of a new way to do things. Well, you know, you've you've designed things. Sometimes you have two seemingly disparate elements that can't be fused together, and then uh, you, you have a moment of satori and realise that actually you've uh, you've had the pieces right in front of you this whole time. And uh, I think after yeah, if you bang out enough episodes of a podcast, sometimes that'll happen for people. And it seems yeah, to have, exactly. anecdotally that seems to have happened. Yeah, yeah, I think it has. I read. And look at a lot more books than we cover. Yeah, exactly. Or that I even play. And I think you can see that some of the things that we've been pushing for since the early days of the show have started to become more common in modules and adventure writing. For example, the modules are feeling more thematically coherent. I think we really kicked off a broader discussion about the use of theme in adventure writing. And I think you can kind of see that filtering out into to some of the writing that, you know, at least some of the stuff that I've seen in recent yeah. years. I think there's less of an emphasis on stat blocks and hard mechanics and more of an emphasis on descriptions and narrative function of monsters and NPCs. We can't claim like credit for all of this stuff, but I think that we help influence that conversation, right? Yeah. Because the very nature of our show is about like looking at old school play in different ways through a different kind of lens. And so I think that you can kind of sort of see that starting to be reflected in a lot of the stuff that's out there. I think dungeons are starting to feel more like interconnected ecologies. That's a real distinct thing I've noticed in recent years. Yeah, and I mean, that was a that was a big thing in like ad and second culture that then died, like really died hard after it went out of fashion. Yeah. Because it had gone too far, like, you know, the ecology. Yeah, for, yeah a little bit. The shrinker yeah. or whatever, but... Uh, that's one of the interesting things about design trends, I guess, is that yeah, think, things get a bit too far, people drop it, but there were good things about that ecology approach, um, which is this idea of unifying things. So whether you do that thematically or in a sort of more naturalistic way, you definitely see this idea of a more designed method of creating you know, modules or you know setting things or even just or collections of monsters. Even you do see these four yeah. words where they say the theme of this book is, and then they'll. You know, the author will lay it out because because they do have a theme, they do have a plan, uh, as opposed to just doing stuff because the old book had a troll in it, so this one's going to have a troll in it as well. Yeah, 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 definitely. Something that we can claim a little more direct credit for is 
role-playing games as a community of players and creators and how that has changed quite a bit over the years. Many people listening to this may not remember, but when we launched this show back at the height of the Google Plus era yeah. of role-playing <laughs> games, there was a lot of acrimony between the story games community and the OSR. There was an incredible amount of tribalism. To be fair, it was driven by a few figures in particular, but I actually think that our show helped sideline some of those divisive figures and their opinions and <laughs> i mean i really do yeah. and like and i think it helped create just a better conversation between these two sides because for me i came back into the hobby kind of in the middle of it and i was drawn back from story games and indie games but and i was like so into them and i couldn't understand why there was this like venomousness in the conversation, right? Like I didn't really have all the like context to understand like why some of the conversations were so negative, but I began to understand like where that was coming from. And one of my major goals for the show, when I pitched the show to you and to Paul and to other people who we were working with on it was I really want to create a bridge between these two communities. And in the way that I know how to do it is to talk about mechanics, it's to analyze, it's to talk about role-playing games from a play perspective and to see if we can't do that. Honestly, I really think that me personally, Jason Cordova, playing OSR stuff, I actually think that for some people, for maybe many people, it was almost like a permission slip for them to like enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah. Because nobody in the gauntlet at that time was playing OSR stuff, but they didn't start until I started playing it, right? The existence of the show, you and I talking about these things, people seeing me getting involved in, in that side of the hobby, I really, really think it helped thaw some of the tensions at least from the story game side of things and i hope and i believe that the osr creator side and player fan base side started to see the validity of story game style play via our conversations that's my sense of it and i i really think that like some of that divisiveness like really really started to drop away more and more as, yeah. as time went on as our show went on yeah and i think it's good it's really good yeah, I think we did see that kind of arc. I mean, what was it partly because Google Plus died and nobody had anywhere to argue anymore? I'm sure that's a lot of it too. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of factors uh, there. Yeah, again. But I 100% am okay with taking some ownership of this, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. I knew that there was a change happening when I started to notice certain things happening on social media. This was post G Plus, right? Yeah. Uh, or at the dying tail end of G Plus. The author of The Gardens of Yin, for example, talking extensively about their experiences with Monster Hearts and other PBTA games. That was a moment for me where I was like, oh, I feel like there's a change happening here. And I have no idea if the author of Gardens of Yin has ever listened to our show or not. To me, that signaled a sort of a change. Or people like uh, Brandon Leon Gambetta getting more involved in OSR type stuff. Like I started to notice these things on social media and like around 2019 or so. And I began thinking, okay, this is... I, I really yeah, think our show sort of is having a good positive influence. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's and again, a an, anecdotally speaking, I have seen a few kind of comments on the things like the OSR discords of one kind or another where someone says, I wasn't really interested in this kind of game. And they'll be talking about something like, maybe not Monster Hearts, but maybe something a bit weird, you know, um, mm. something a bit uh, decentralized. Yeah. And then they'll say, but then I was listening to that Black Dragon podcast. And uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, although the, one one thing I do regret through this whole thing is we did choose a podcast name that people will consistently get wrong. It's a, a <laughs> yeah. black dragon. <laughs> yeah. It's fear of a black dragon, not fear of the black dragon. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah never mind. <laughs> and it's a joke about the public enemy. Album yeah. It's not even really a joke. We just, wanted a, yeah, we just wanted a cool sounding name. Yeah. It's a public enemy. Album. Yeah. 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 <laughs> anyway. But yeah, I think, I think those streams are crossing. I think that we have played a role in that blending of like player and creator space between the OSR and story games. And I think it's really wonderful. I think that there's always going to be like divisive people, especially on social media, who are going to try to create harder lines. I, I think there's a couple of people who lately in social media who are trying to take up that mantle again. But I think it's important that we just keep having the conversations we're having and ignore yeah. those people. I will say from a personal standpoint... Doing Fear of a Black Dragon has really affected my life in positive, interesting ways. There's a basic intrinsic joy to just, you know, meeting up with you and doing this periodically. Yeah. But also in a more 
direct beneficial thing, I guess. People in the OSR community have followed my own games that I publish, like B-Bay getting good coverage on the Alexandrian, for example. Mm -hmm. I don't think that would have happened before Fear of a Black Dragon or without the existence of Fear of a Black Dragon. Even just small things, like the fact that I now run The Secret of Castro Negro every year at Halloween. Is that... Uh, yeah. yeah, that's something that wouldn't have happened if not for Fear of Black Dragon. So. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I found it's... Um, I think we've sort of talked a bit before about how it's sort of forced us... Well, me at least, I, I guess both of us, to try out things we probably otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't have bothered mm-hmm. with if we weren't covering yeah. it for the show. And yeah, I've definitely... Yeah. Um, like if I think about... Uh, my my latest magnum opus revolution comes to the kingdom that is a a collection of i mean very oh it's not really osr but it is it's like you know i have become vaguely fascinated with this whole idea of a very power by the apocalypse thing of little mini games for different things little subsystems that all Mm -hmm. kind of drop in and out of play or sort of and zoom in and out Mm -hmm. of different levels yeah and that's another fun crossover between (laughs) osr and uh, the story games world is uh, both camps Love a little mini game. Uh, Love a little mini game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Speaking of Rich, I think we have a little message from Rich who we never get to hear from. Oh, yeah. Well, hello there, fans of a black dragon. Or should it be fans of a fear of a black dragon? That's, That's too many syllables. Yeah. This is Rich. I'm the producer of the show. And I've been the producer for half of its runtime. I started in episode 49, Times That Fry. It's been a pleasure helping to shape Tom and Jason's expertise on gaming and their viewpoints on modules and adventures into the final product that you listen to and hopefully enjoy. And I can't miss the opportunity to pay respects to my good buddy Paul Edson, who helped to start the show. He was the original podcast producer. He helped to develop it, and he helped to make what you enjoy today. I'm just following in his footsteps, and luckily I have a couple of really good talkers to edit. This is a good show, and I'm glad that you are listening. And here's for 100 more. Okay, listeners, we are now going to reveal our top five modules now tom and i we have not shared our lists with each other so this is a surprise uh for us too Um, and how before we begin may i ask how did you arrive at your at your list very good question uh my list is a combination of things it's things that i just personally have really enjoy and find to be quite fun at the table Mm. but also there's a couple of things on there that i think are their quality is just so high that it's difficult not to put them on the list Mm -hmm. um and also i've got a choice a couple of choices that are there because of their influence on the broader direction of adventure writing and their influence on how adventure writing has gone and so it's a it's a combination of things and i will say also that this list might be totally different next year uh this is the list as it stands at this moment so yeah that can happen uh my list i think then is quite is different to yours in a way because i confined myself to things that we've covered on the show and okay. uh, I also I used uh, one of those programs where it just shows you pairs of things over and over again, and you choose your favorite one. So it's a combination. Okay. It's a combination of science and uh, impulse. Okay, that's very very interesting. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I have one thing that is that we have not yet covered okay. on the show, okay. but otherwise the other four are things that we've covered on the show. All right, do you want to go first from five? Or yeah, let's go. For, yeah. Let's do five. So my number five is in fact the thing that we have not yet covered on the show. I will say that this number five probably bumped Ghosts of Mismore off my list. It's also benefiting a lot from recency bias because I just finished running it. If this had been recorded a month ago, probably Ghosts of Mismore would be number five. But instead, it is Sleeping Place of the Feathered Swine. Ah, Have you heard this one? I've heard of it many times. I've got a copy. Yeah. haven't read it or run it yet but uh this is and this is on the to-do list isn't it so yeah i suspect we're gonna talk about on the show at some point this is one of those modules that is gated behind an adult content warning on drive through Mm. and so it had my attention for that reason and so i picked it up at the at someone's recommendation or i found it at someone's recommendation and i ran two sessions of it using trophy gold very recently and i have to say it's really good it's not for everyone it's incredibly gross, and it has a lot of really squicky stuff in it. It has earned its adult rating. 
but it's fantastic. It's a small dungeon. It's a tight experience, but it is structured beautifully. It is paced beautifully. It's a sort of cave crawl dungeon. The order that most groups will take it, the pacing of the encounters and the things you encounter and the final culmination of it all, including a little sort of like bonus thing you can find if you go even just a little deeper, it is perfect. It hits all the right beats in all the right places. And yet it does have a couple of opportunities to sort of short circuit that flow, which would probably create, that's not what we did, but it would probably create like its own interesting, like sort of dynamic experience. And I don't want to say too much about it yet because we're going to go deeper in a future episode, I expect, but it's grotesque. It's horrifying. It's structured beautifully. The writing is solid and good. Presentationally, it's very easy to run. Mm -hmm. And it was just a big hit. Everybody really had a great time with it. Fantastic. Okay. What's your number five? My number five, uh, narrowly beating out. Actually, do you know what? We can do some honorable mentions at the end. Forget that. Okay, my number... F yeah. We'll do some honorable mentions, yeah. yeah. My number five is The Wizardarium of Calabraxis. Oh, which, interesting choice. I remember yeah. this one, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is by a Claytonian. It's a kind of mm -hmm. single creator illustrating and writing the whole thing. And uh, it's just unique. You know, it has a lot of uh, classic OSR tropes in it. You know, monkey people, bats. Well, it's the one with the head swapper bats. That's uh, maybe mm -hmm. one reason I like it. And kind of weird time loops are in it as well. Another OSR, now OSR staple. Although I think at the time it came out, maybe that wasn't yet. And... Uh, it's so easy to use as well because it centers on this one uh, isometric cavern dungeon map that you can look at and just refer to very you know, quick reminders as you're going through it. And I think ostensibly you're going in there to rescue some missing children or something. But that really kind of falls away pretty quickly as you're exploring all these fun, quirky magic items and things. And uh, one of the best things being a, a trap that's really obvious, which I think is an underused Thing, namely, it's the, a room that's going to crush you if you if you the ceiling is going to drop on you and crush everyone if you trigger the trap. And as soon as you walk in, you know that because you can see a crushed dead body there. And like, <laughs> right, uh, and then yeah. of course that that's the thrill of it is figuring out how do we do this without setting off the trap. Not this kind of oh my god, there's a trap. We've all died approach. We should probably save the long talks for higher up the uh, higher up the chart. But I think that's one of the things about good OSR design is when. Uh, the stakes are made very clear. That's a story gamey term. When it's very clear what's going to happen if things go right or wrong, and then you get to decide: Are you going to be brave or are you going to be clever? You know, what are you going to do with it? And that's uh, situations like that can be so simple and yet so compelling at the same time. And Calibrax is, is full of that. Plus, it's got a little weird supplement at the end for doing time travel. So, yeah, I love it. It's great. Okay, let's go to our number four picks. Okay. My number four pick is. The Croaking Fane, ah. which is a Dungeon Crawl Classics thing that we covered a while back. And I've run probably six or seven times. And this is one that's on the list because it's just damn fun. It is probably not the module that most people would think of as the quintessential Dungeon Crawl Classics module. For most people, that would probably be Sailors. Mm -hmm. But it's really, really fun. It's in this temple to this not even the main frog god of the world it's like this secondary frog god <laughs> this pissed off secondary frog god it's just so good it again the structure is fantastic it is a really really classic sort of like temple crawl it has fantastic set pieces every corner every chamber every room has something really cool to see and do like all the best dungeon crawl classic stuff it leads into this more final almost like cosmic horror style encounter that's something that's very common in those modules it's just fantastic the moment when the characters find the spawning ground for these priests that are changing into like frog creatures it is such a first of all it's a very particular dcc kind of moment but also it sings at the table the players are just in it it is awe inspiring and so so cool but yeah, just filled with great details, great set pieces. It's just a lot of fun. You just can't go wrong with the croaking vein. Awesome. Super thematic as well. That's the... Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're talking about the theme. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> no, it's all right. My number four is the historical hex crawl, Times That Fry Men's Souls. 
Oh, interesting. I was wondering if this would make either of our lists. Yeah, yeah okay. Interesting. So, which I think you've just given away. It's maybe not in your top three, but uh, yeah. Oh, so well, uh, no, it's not. No. <laughs> yeah. It's basically an honorable mention and for me. Yeah, but, I mean, I, yeah. I, I really enjoyed this. I've, so I've run it a couple of times, and it's a, a kind of a dense hex crawl set in mm-hmm. New York State, the American War of Independence. Although that's not really what you're doing as, uh, you know, hex crawling OSR characters. You're sort of rambling around, encountering different armies at different times, but also the civilians and refugees in between them some weird magic stuff maybe a demon or bananas floating in the bay that you can collect and sell because uh, they fell off a cargo ship which is a thing that we did and it's it's great it's compact you know your characters could travel across the map in like maybe a couple of days mm-hmm. but it feels big and it is big and it feels like it's part of something bigger which it also is and it also it's well designed it's not just each hex is a whole new realm that you're wandering into. There are threads of things that are connected between them, and the beginning of the book tells you what they are and where you can find them, so that, you know, if you find someone looking for two missing children, you can go back and see where those two missing children actually are and what's going on. And uh, it's just so evocative, Mm -hmm. in play, super atmospheric. You you felt like you're free to do what you want, but there are things to do, like there are obvious things you could go and do. And, uh, yeah, it's just been really fun and really solid when I've played it. And it's just such a an unusual but, in hindsight, obvious choice for a setting. You know what I mean? Like one of those things that you go, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense once you see it. You're like, yeah. oh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Love that. Number three for me is a tie. Ah. But it'll make sense in a moment. A tie between Castle Amber and the original Ravenloft. I enjoyed them both immensely when running them and playing them. Obviously, Castle Amber was a big influence on Ravenloft. But I've actually chosen them as my number three. I think they're both really good and enjoyable on their own in, on their own merits in a lot of ways. Ravenloft in particular, you can definitely see its influence on how dungeon modules would be created going forward. But they are both highly influential just in a bigger way. You can see so much of video game dungeon design in castle amber and ravenloft you can just see its influences on just like so much like pop culture the the influences of these two modules on pop culture to follow yeah the modules the adventures themselves i think ravenloft is the slightly better of the two because it's a little more coherent than castle amber is castle amber it's a little more wild and uh all over the place Ravenloft is definitely like a little more tighter and more coherent and therefore I think a little a little better. But they both have, again, incredible set pieces, very, very influential on fantasy, adventure, pop culture that would follow oh, and yeah. fiction that would follow. Yeah, that's, I mean, I think in, in terms of just bringing their particular fantasy subgenres into this is a thing you can do D&D modules about now. Um, right. is also yeah. is big, yeah. right? You know? Absolutely. Um, even though yeah. I, th- yeah. I guess there's no way they were the first in either no act. but that's not important it's the they're the keystones yeah i think they did it in a way yeah. where it opened up a lot of people's eyes exactly yeah ravenloft especially and i was there and i think there was like a before ravenloft and after ravenloft i just think that things were different after ravenloft like you just could sense like things changing especially because we were kind of quickly sliding into 2e at a certain point and ravenloft had a big influence on the development of 2e adventure style and stuff and so anyway but they're both great and great fun irrespective of that as well so yeah awesome i sort of regret i don't think i've picked any of mine based on historical significance which seems, <laughs> seems like an oversight now but whatever it's okay it's just my faves you're just gonna have to do well, it yeah, yeah yeah it's okay yeah, yeah yeah so my number three then is uh and you knew this had to happen eventually it's death on the reich uh, for mm-hmm. one fantasy role play man I, I stared long and hard at some of these things where different parts of the enemy within campaign were up against something else but i think death on the reich is the naples ultra of the the gritty warhammer-esque fantasy and again they're like so influential it has everything that you really need it to have it's got chaos magic in it it's got well it's got a lot of riverboat adventures which is a very warhammer thing but beyond that like in general for fantasy adventure games you've got battles on windswept hills and then you've got the towering gothic edifice that is uh, castle wittgenstein and the sort of mouldering village outside it and uh, bandits in the woods and there's a little dungeon mm-hmm. oh man the whole thing is just it's colossal I th- and now that i've sort of put it on a list and said it out loud i think it's clearly the one like if you were to take if you were told you could only have one book out of that campaign i think it's got to be death on the right you know it's 
Just so well put together, so many great set pieces as well. Which is the one with the castle? It's the one with the castle, yeah, Death on the Right. Yeah, that's yeah. my then that's my favorite of those two. Yeah, exactly. It's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's just awesome. It's got, yeah, it's got Frankenstein in it, it's got a vampire, yeah. it's got Robin Hood, kind of. It's just wonderful. And it is funny to think that we uh, correctly put player agency and choices at the forefront of the game experience. And yet, there is something about a set piece, as long as it doesn't outstay mm-hmm. its welcome, that can be just um, just so impressive and really anchor your memory and your good experience of the mm-hmm. game. And uh, mm-hmm. Death on the Reich has, has that in spades. So yeah, that, that is my number three. It's interesting that our number threes were the big castle adventures, right? Yeah. The big classic castle adventures. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so so far our lists have not overlapped and maybe they won't at all, but... I don't know, I, I, have, a f- have, I have a feeling about number one, but let's, let's see what you're going to... We have the two. best shot in the top two, I think. Yeah, yeah. okay, go on. My number two is Deep Carbon Observatory. Ah. I've waxed poetic about Deep Carbon Observatory in many places on this show as well, and it's no surprise that I love it. I consider DCO to be a masterpiece. I don't know how else to describe it. If you could say that a fantasy adventure module or just a, a, a scenario or a module could be a masterpiece, if you could use that word to describe it, I think DCO has to be deserving of that. It's such a particular vision. It has a really particular point of view. Again, it's set pieces, it's moments, the dungeons, the monsters. Like It is just so unique, and it it just expresses something that I don't think has been equaled, really, since it came out. And yet, it still knows where it comes from. DCO still really fundamentally understands its heritage as a D&D adventure. So the way that those things are woven in as well, it kind of just makes it all come together. You appreciate that the author appreciates that, but also you appreciate this really striking, different vision for fantasy adventure that DCO presents. And I love it. And I actually haven't looked at the new version yet. I know that they like kickstarted a second version of DCO, and I have not looked at that yet. But I think the first one is just about perfect. And so um, I I don't know where you go from there, but maybe they did. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I'm, uh, I can't really add anything to that. I think that's a, that's a great choice for number two. But it is not my choice for number two. It's not your it choice. Is, no. Okay, what is your number two? My number two is, and this one is a difficult one to choose in some ways because I think it's quite difficult to get hold of. I don't know if you can even buy it now. And it is the Call of Cthulhu Adventure Dream Factory. Dream Factory. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And this is one yeah. because... I, this is up here and pretty high because I feel like it, it's sort of one of the great missed classics of... It's really good. Well, I don't know, sil- Silver Age, so you could call it yeah, Cthulhu yeah. scenario. Design. Because it is, it's like a, a social point crawl. So the way it's organized kind of prefigures the point crawl in a way. It, it sort of have, has some similarities with Power Behind the Throne in that sense. This sort of going from person to person to put together the mystery. It has interlocking but not awfully complex multiple plot threads and and a sort of natural flow to it and it comes out different every time and yet it still always seems to work and and give you a satisfying conclusion and it's set in 1920s Hollywood with silent movies and stuff and that's just pretty cool and again this emergent horror of these set pieces that the players create themselves which I guess is the next step above the good set piece isn't it it's where you give the players the tools to horrify themselves or to or in a more positive game to kind of create a sense of wonder for themselves but in Dream Factory very much the horror side of things as they realize what's going on with that weird ex-Soviet film director and his magic camera (laughs) and so on Um, but yeah it's really good I regretfully yeah it was published in an anthology which I think didn't get a huge amount of attention at the time. And I think that's the only place it was published. So it, it languished a bit, which I think is a shame. And I, I hope more people can track it down and at least read it and preferably play it because it's it's just really good. It's just really, it really good. It is very, yeah. it's very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So before we get to our number one picks, why don't we go ahead and do our honorable mentions at this point? I do have some honorable mentions. I've already mentioned a couple of them, but I have three more as well. <laughs> My honorable mentions are Scenic Dunsmouth, Mm -hmm. which I think is just fantastic. It's so unique and striking. I have not looked at the new version. I'm just going off the old version. But the old version was just 
visually striking it had a really really cool card based mechanism for setting up the game yeah, so if yeah. you're into like if you're into lonely fun as a gm it's like <laughs> scenic dunsmith is the perfect lonely fun module and it's my kind of thing yeah. it's family history in a seedy little village with dark secrets and some of them you'll uncover some of them you'll never get yeah. to see and i just love all that it was our episode one as well which well, is, episode one I mean, it was yeah, yeah. Gotta, gotta love episode. That, yeah my other honorable mentions are Sailors on the Starless Sea for many of the same reasons that I picked Croaking Fane in position four. So my um, Met just, honorables as well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just happen to like Croaking Fane a little better, but but Sailors of the Starless Sea really does capture that DCC-ness to it. You know, what I, we've said this before, and what I love about DCC modules is even the ones that are for like zero level characters or low level characters, they're still really cool. There are no rats in the basement adventures in DCC. No, no, that's right. You just, you're doing stuff. Yeah, you get cool shit. You get cool yeah. shit. And so this is a, a great example of that. That final piece of sailors in the starless sea with the little underground lake and the little island in the middle of it where the ritual's happening so fucking good i mean that is like uh, a plus (laughs) and my last honorable mention is wet grandpa one that we covered a little bit ago wet grandpa i think is a really terrific and interesting module and i think if there are people who are getting into adventure writing and trying to look for inspirations outside of what's very popular right now, like outside of Morkborg, outside of Mothership and all that stuff. Look to Wet Grandpa as a way to express your personal style and perspective on adventure writing. I think Wet Grandpa has such a great point of view. And so it's my honorable mention as well. What are your honorable mentions? All right. Well, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, Sailors on the Starless Sea was kind of in my list. I also have Lawn Song of the Bachelor, which is I, I mm-hmm. like for, you know, Terrific uh, mini setting slash adventure slash. I mean, you could you could do a lot with it, and uh, it's almost in the the slow gaming bracket in some ways. Mm-hmm. Like it has a sort yeah. of it's a languid adventure until it suddenly isn't. At which point it becomes terrifying and, and action packed, mm-hmm. which is cool. What else is on my list? Mouth Brood, the sci-fi oh, horror. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we just covered that did one quite yeah. recently. Yeah, that's that's up there for me. Yeah. Uh, the author Amanda Lee Frank, she's really identif- she's identified what she wants to do, and then then she she does it. <laughs> and then, and she uh, did it. Yeah, super yeah, effective. Yeah. yeah, worked really well. Yeah. And I think I mean, I really, I have a lot of honourable mentions, but I'll just do one more, and I'm gonna say that is a uh, Primal Quest, which is kind of a game and not a module, but it's the the cave. Mm-hmm cave Mm -hmm. osr game and uh had a good time with that and again just a good choice of a setting that works really well with not exactly dungeon crawl mechanics because there it it actually has its own system that moves away from that but it has that yeah the adventure game mechanic that sort of quite traditional feeling way of approaching things and yet once you start doing Mm -hmm. it doing your little hex crawl from the from the tribe village to over there in the mysterious uh, alien tower and whatnot you discover that all it takes sometimes is is overlaying that on a different framework on a different setting and it feels quite different and exciting and and so on so yeah primal quest for my third one great picks okay so now our number one pick for each of us mine will probably not be a surprise to anyone but i will say that it was almost my number two but it slipped into number one because i've just run it a lot more than dco and just had more experience with it and so therefore it it lives in my heart more than DCO does, and therefore it's in my number one position. <laughs> okay. And that is the old Call of Cthulhu module, The Secret, Secret of, of Castro Negro. Negro. Yeah, Secret of Castro Negro is my number one. May I just jump in? It's also my number one. It is your number one also. <laughs> okay, see, it's in a lot of ways, this module is like the mascot of Fear of a Black Dragon in some sense. Yeah. Because really, if you think about it, our discussion of The Secret of Castro Negro, I think, is when you and I, as people, podcast creators and i think that's when you and i really really came into our own if you go back and listen to that particular episode i mean i think the show was really good from the jump but the secret of castro negro episode i think was when you and i really really started to develop our personal our fear of a black dragon sort of point of view and it really came out in that discussion so it's special to me for that reason, but also it's just really fucking it's, good. It's right? a great scenario. It's scenario. so good. Yeah, it's so, <laughs> yeah, so good. Like, it does. It's funny that your top two are COC things. That's really, that's really wild. That is weird. Yeah, I felt a bit bad about that because we're meant to be more. I mean, no, they're, not, <laughs> they're my, my choices are yeah. my choices. Let's yeah. leave it. And also yeah. the thing I think that what's, 
what makes Castro Negro so accessible is it is kind of a D&D structure as well. It's got the creepy village and then there's a... It, it is, you know, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Um, and yeah a wizard, it, on, wizard on the Hill, you know, exactly. <laughs> it's, got, yeah. it's got all that stuff, yeah. yeah. Um, I've talked about it at length. I run it every year. I've run it every year basically since we originally talked about it and I kind of pick like three or four special players I want to I want to honor that year by letting them play in my Castro Negro game nice. I consider it like a treat if I choose you to be in my Castro Negro game it's because I, I think very well of you it's such a pleasure to run for people when I'm running it I am just so in my element and I run yeah. it using Cthulhu Dark to be clear yeah, I don't yeah, use same. COC but it's such a pleasure for me to run because it has really great NPCs that you can kind of have fun with the characterizations. It's got a beautiful structure. The lead up, the little like pre-mystery, the pre-investigation yeah, yeah. back in Silver City. And then you have the bus ride. I usually start with the bus ride. I actually think the bus ride is a really great place to start. Yeah. And then you get to the village itself. There's the whole like thing of, oh, the bus won't be back for a little while. So you yeah, know, that's you good. Know, you're kind that's of stuck good. here, you know. <laughs> it's got the weird like guy taking pot shots at you, that whole 70s era, you know, weird thing going going on 70s 70s like kind of action horror thing going on it's just got so many so much mystery so much lore and it's really distinct in its setting of new mexico and yet it still feel it feels really cthulhu mythos it does yeah i think that's both the evocation of new mexico i mean i've never been to new mexico um or Mm. mexico classic but i i feel (laughs) it feels believable yeah off the page and uh there's the whole thing with the green eyes and the the family Mm -hmm. that's involved which is such a great 70s horror motif but also even though even though it has all these great details and things that happen it's also such a i don't know if it's technically a high concept like they used to talk about in 80s hollywood but once you've run it once you could run it again from memory without having to look at it again because the concepts yeah. are so rock solid you show up in town here's where the mm. here's where the bodies actually are here's the guy that made them into bodies instead of people you could probably just riff off that and your vague memories of the scenario yeah. itself. Yeah, of course yeah. of course it is better to have to have the text don't get me wrong yeah it's just so well again so well put together that doesn't there's not it really is. anything that's out of place, you know. There's, probably there's if I were to no go back and read yeah. it, there's maybe there'll be a few things, you know. No, I've run, I've run it so many times at this point. There's nothing. Every place in the little town, every little place just outside the little town, there's always something horrifying to find. There's always something weird yeah. to discover. There's always some strange mystery. It's all connected in a really cool way, but you don't have to see everything to enjoy it. If you do see everything, you get the full story. That's right. That's of right. The place, yeah. but you don't need to do that. And it culminates in this incredible confrontation at the Casa de Diaz or whatever it's called. It has this incredible like culmination at that villa with the wizard and Greedy Gut and uh, the rat yeah. Yeah. and his laboratory. But then you can go like even deeper to that really, really horrifying part that's just like a little tiny paragraph at the end oh, talking yeah, yeah. about the tunnels the, underneath. The tunnels, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Castro Negro feels lived in. It feels like a real place. It is just packed with great details. A favorite like little small detail about that, I love it when players pick up on it, is the fact that this occult shop in the town, a town with like 500 people yeah. in it, or if, if even that, yeah. this occult shop, it's like something you would find like in a city. And it's like, why is this here of all things? And then when the guy says, we do a brisk mail order business as yeah. a way of explaining away like why that shop is yeah, there. Yeah. It's so funny and so good. <laughs> yeah. It's so great. I just have so yeah. many good memories of it. Yeah, good stuff. Folks, you got to go play The Secret yeah, of Castro Negro. I say do it in Cthulhu Dark. But, yeah, yeah, I think, that, yeah, that's what I would do. Also, it's not even that long. It's like, what, uh, eight pages max, I'm going to say? Yeah, yeah. I managed to stretch it out over three sessions. I usually do it on a Halloween weekend. So yeah, yeah. I do it Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But that's because I like for the players to be able to see everything. Like, I like for yeah, them to be able to, like, yeah. see every part of it. Yeah, yeah. So. Depends what kind of pace you want, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I think you could probably do it in a more compressed way, too. That's our top five modules. That was a lot of fun. Uh, Let's take a quick break and then we'll come back and answer some questions. Awesome. Hi, listeners. Jason here. If you're enjoying this podcast, you should support it on Patreon. We here at The Gauntlet love making these shows, but there are a lot of costs associated with making them, and we depend on your Patreon support to cover those costs. A monthly $2 pledge doesn't seem like much, but it goes a long way towards us being able to make these podcasts. And if you pledge $6, you get early access to all the releases coming out of Gauntlet Publishing. 
At any given time, our Patreon feed has scenarios and playbooks for The Between, new mysteries for Brindlewood Bay, incursions for Trophy Dark and Trophy Gold, and more. $6 patrons also get early access to our big standalone game releases. We have four big games coming in 2023, Arkham Herald, Public Access, The Silt vs. RPG, and Moonlight Vale, and you'll get them early and at the best possible price if you make that $6 pledge. Remember, we can't do any of this without you, so head over to patreon.com forward slash gauntlet and pledge today. Thanks. Okay, so we are now going to do some listener questions. I, I asked on our Discord for folks to submit questions that they might want to hear Tom and I talk about, maybe topics that we don't talk about very often or things that our format doesn't let us talk about. And so we got a lot of question submissions, way more than we can do in this episode. And a few of them are maybe worthy of their own expert delve topic in yeah. future episodes. So we'll maybe skip some of them, but we picked a few here. Why don't we start with this question from Ivan, or Ivan, I suppose, which is, are there any underexplored settings or subjects that you'd like to see more of in modules? Tom? This is, first of all, a great question, but secondly, one that I think is quite hard to answer because I thought about this for a long time, and I think I've realized that I don't, I don't know. I don't know until I see them that I you want to. You'll know until you do. see it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, the thing I'm prepping to run for a kind of Halloween miniseries during October is Bad Kansas City by Sean McAnally, uh, the author, by the way, of uh, Times the Fry Men Souls. Hmm. And that is a, an urban hex crawl set in a demon-haunted 1930s Kansas City. And that's the thing. I, I could have, you know, you could have asked me to list hex crawl settings you'd like to run and give me a hundred years, I would never have got to that. But I'm uh, I'm excited to run it. Now that I know that this is a setting that exists, I think it's a really good idea, but I would never... You would never have thought of it. I never yeah, thought of it. And yeah, so for that reason, yeah. I, I struggle to think of things that I think are underrepresented. But although, having said that, I think, I do think that kind of the non-fantasy, non-science fiction genres, so things like, yeah, like this kind of hard-boiled gangster stuff, maybe more historical settings, that is one strand but i then again I, I see a lot of people creating stuff for it already so there's probably there's definitely other things i haven't thought of yeah it was a tough question for me too for that reason but also because i usually don't like it when non-dungeon scenarios or non-fantasy adventure stories get shoved into a dungeon crawling framework something i found kind of frustrating when brindlewood bay first came out was people wanting to transfer these elderly ladies into a dungeon crawling format or to try mm. to run b bay as a dungeon crawl and that just drove me crazy because it's like i wrote this game to be in a particular mode and to work a certain way to tell a certain type of story and like i wish you could just take the game on its own terms and do yeah, that well. whatever like have your fun however you want to do it i'm not here to judge that but as the creator of brindlewood bay i found it a little frustrating that so many people couldn't even like conceive of the game existing outside of a dungeon crawl, right? That was so weird to me. Yeah. I don't think every story should be runnable in D&D. But all that said, until I see the thing, I don't really know what I was missing. But I'll try. I still think we haven't really gotten a very good adventure on the high seas module. That is correct, yeah. Especially one that replicates the feel of being a crew member on a ship. I am particularly interested in a fantasy whalers type adventure. I would love mm. a fantasy whaling type story. I think that'd be super cool. I would love to see more court crawl adventures. I'm heavy on the social encounters, but intermingled with fights and puzzles. That's There's probably a real alchemy to making that work, but I think it can be done, and I'd like to see more of it. I'd love to see more murder mystery adventures. I think Magonium Mines was good, but not quite what I'm looking for in that regard, mostly because you could kind of skip the murder mystery bits if you wanted to. Well, that's true, although, uh, yeah, yeah. That's, for, that's for the players who... Uh... <laughs> who yeah. don't want to do, who want to play a murder mystery but not yeah, a mystery. Yeah. yeah yeah i guess yeah i think yeah. i think actually your two suggestions are simpatico i think the court crawl and the murder mystery together they're kind are, of the same thing are how yeah. you osr up uh, that kind of thing i think yeah, yeah i think that's probably right and then one thing that i noticed as i was creating my game public access is there is not a lot of role-playing game representation in the internet horror culture vibes like it's not really a thing it's been very beneficial to public access because the public access yeah, is like niche. the game it is the, <laughs> is i've got my own little niche to myself but i think that would be kind of cool i'd be kind of interested to see like what the osr community could do with themes of of like analog and internet horror i think yeah that's fun. an interesting one because yeah. i think uh, i periodically think uh, hey i should run a call of cthulhu style campaign where you're making a podcast and and that's such an obvious yeah. idea that it almost doesn't like it's the kind of thing where people would go <laughs> well that's that's just a campaign frame. Why would you 
make yeah. a published thing out of that. But I think actually that frameworks are often as mm-hmm. valuable as the modules. Yeah. So somebody please go and write the podcast in Cthulhu or something, and then we'll we'll reconvene at this spot and, and see how it goes. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. There's uh, there's a whole seem to be mind there of yeah modern internet culture but also that kind of nokia te- is what do they call it like nokia punk sort of uh, mm-hmm. x files yeah. and uh, oh, St- yeah, steven seagal yeah. movie yeah, era yeah, things yeah. where like what's now fairly mundane technology is presented as the cutting yeah. edge and, and a bit scary yeah. you know yeah that's yeah, yeah that'd be good next question another one from yvonne is there any material that you'd like to have featured on the show but couldn't due to the constraints of the format? Yes, yeah, lots, yeah. <laughs> loads. And anything involving uh, collections of many short things is a bit tricky to do. For a few years, I don't know if they do them anymore, but back in the G Plus days, there was some group that would do the one-page dungeon contest. Do you remember the one-page dungeon I contest? I do, I do, yeah. Yeah. It was super cool, and you can get the anthologies of the different entries. I guess they're on drive through now, yeah, the anthologies. Exactly. But basically, people would create a one-page dungeon. They would do their own artwork for the dungeon, and all the encounters, all the little keyed locations would fit in the margins. And some of them were like fairly mundane sorts of caves and castles and things like that. But some of them were like really unique and unusual settings. Like They really took the idea of one page and use that as a a creative constraint to create something really, really cool in a small space. Regrettably, I have not figured out how to cover this in our format. I don't know how to do it because each individual entry is too short for an episode, but I don't know how to analyze and or review in a meaningful way the entire yeah, collection yeah right? exactly for like you can year yeah yeah like the obvious thing is to go oh we'll give we'll do like one minute per page but that then that's just giving that's, short shrift sounds to horrible that yeah, need, yeah it's awful I'm, I'm sorry i said it now um so like it's yeah yeah that, anything like that is quite quite tricky to do you know like when you get mm-hmm. collections of pamphlet style things as well sometimes that people publish that's a tricky one yeah well and even we've even had some trouble covering just short dungeons yeah we did feast and we did a couple of other like little small ones and i had really good particular reasons why i wanted to do those and feature them on the show or a tower darkly that was another like really really short one but in those cases in the tower darkly especially its brevity was the subject of the expert delve right yeah, so yeah. that was our excuse for doing that one it's otherwise very very hard to cover these really short ones because there's just not enough material there for us to talk about yeah and and then conversely of course there's the exact opposite which is that it takes us this long to play through and then review a normal size scenario mega dungeons How are you gonna do a big, a big one yeah, yeah. Like, i mean we've done those like multi-part episodes and we've obviously sometimes we've done within yeah. episodes yeah. in order to cover something like i was determined to cover yunsu and carcosa and some of those yeah. bigger setting yeah. books but something like ardenvul or, or um the mega dungeons are really yeah. hard in our format like i don't know how yeah. to do a mega dungeon in yeah. our format for example um, like in, in my ongoing dcc game at the moment we have uh, castle white rock in in the background which is one of the earlier mm-hmm. goodman games and it's a mega dungeon Mm-hmm. And the, you know, I think we're on like level five of a lot. But even if we've done all of them, how do we then compress that into yeah. between one and three podcast episodes? I don't know that we do. So um, that might be one where we have to just, uh, I don't know, yeah, break the format and do something else. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. I have one more thing that I would love. I would have, I would love to find a way to cover. But again, our format does not really support it, which is Harlem Unbound by Chris Spivy. Or maybe Spivey, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. But Harlow Unbound is, I think it's now in its maybe third edition. Uh, I, I know there's at least two editions of it. But basically, it's a collection of Call of Cthulhu adventures or adventures, mysteries yeah. that take place in Harlem Renaissance, essentially, right? In 1920s New York and Harlem. And they have this really cool, particular point of view about the mythos, about race about roaring 20s culture like all that stuff that kind of comes together in a super cool way the problem format wise with harlem unbound is i don't think covering an individual mystery from the book does the whole book justice and we don't really have the space to cover the whole book and so and i don't really have the time to run the whole book but i would love to some like i'd love to find a way to do it because i really really love harlem unbound but yeah uh that's that's another one too yeah Our next question is from Jasper. Jasper asks, I wanted to ask if you could go further into what you mean by fantasy nonfiction. If you could explain and or give some pointers as to what inspired you to this idea. Tom, this is all you, buddy. Yeah, unfortunately, this is all me. Uh, Although I'm glad to see somebody actually saying the phrase apart from me. Fantasy nonfiction. What do I mean by that? It was based on... 
some observations I had, I think particularly while running uh, the Enemy Within campaign for, for Warhammer, but you know, also generally any kind of game where the player characters being competent at things is the focus. And it was there that I noticed there is a, there is a kind of joy in looking at some of the, I mean, mundane details is a bad way to put it, but the way things get done, like I was asking a character, you know that some hunters pass this way, but what? how do you know that? Because you're a, a ranger guy, how do you know that? And then the player would respond to me. And so I started thinking about how, well, basically, non-fiction books are, as it's often mentioned, more popular than fiction in terms of sales. Is there anything that we do in role-playing games that kind of addresses that? And I think there is. So when you look at story games, obviously, they are exploring uh, genre a lot, like story structure. And then at the far end of the opposite end of the spectrum, traditional uh, adventure games are sort of taking a world and then physically exploring around it. And so like, what's useful at that end of the spectrum in particular, I think, is this idea that the world exists and we're just going to see what happens to some people that live in it. And they're maybe not going to have a compelling story arc. You know, you read biographies of people and there'll be a bit where, I don't know, Alec Guinness meets someone in Monaco in 1952 and they have a conversation and they, he never sees that person again, right? Like, um, I am making this up, by the way. This isn't an Alec Guinness anecdote. But you just have these hanging threads that don't get resolved or you have these things where difficulties seem to not, like, come in any particular rhythm or sense apart from the fact that they're the natural rhythm of the world and the weird thing is that that imperfect construction is actually quite satisfying in its way you know it's like the wabi-sabi um, artistic principle uh, of things being slightly malformed or imperfect and in games that can be fun as well I have discovered I think it's particularly good for low fantasy um, also again my game revolution comes to the kingdom is all about this sort of this idea that you just live in the 19, mid-1960s <laughs> fictional kingdom and we find out what happens to you. And it goes well with games that have high lethality as well, when, when people can just <laughs> get killed or taken out of the story very quickly. It's very satisfying to approach those kind of stories in terms of what you would do if you were writing a non-fiction book or if you were making a documentary. Because even when you're recording things that really happened in the real world and not fantasy world, you do still choose your themes and you do still decide your start and end points and you do still decide which characters you're going to focus on. So you you still don't need to have that, oh, it's not what my character would do issue, because that doesn't matter. This documentary, this particular documentary, is about the guys that did go into the dungeon. So that other <laughs> that other PC need not apply. And I mean, that's sort of rambly and unhelpful, but I hope it sort of uh, gives some examples of what I think is the fun of trying to document some people's lives in a in a fantasy world as if it was real. And, and I don't mean that down to the whole sort of thing about, you know, worrying too much about weapon reaches or uh, very detailed encumbrance rules, although you can do that if you want. But it is just this idea that it's the world and the people that feel like they, if you weren't looking at them, they'd still be doing something. They would be off camera doing something else. And that's turned out to be quite a fun way to play games, but also a little bit messy. It won't give you those nicely resolved stories that you might want. So yeah, use it with discretion, I would say. Is that helpful? I'm very bad at explaining this. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was thorough. <laughs> we'll go with thorough. No, it was great. That was great, Tom. All right, why don't you pick a question from the list? Shall we go for this first one from uh, McWarmaker? Mm, okay. What do you feel the OSR space is most lacking, and how do you think it could be improved? Oh, boy. I have a lot to say about yeah, this, actually. Don't worry about this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot to say about it. I will caveat everything I'm about to say with, I am not super involved in the OSR community apart from the show. I don't hang out in OSR spaces and I tend to rely on other people to like tell me what's cool and what's good. And this is maybe not the best approach, but nevertheless, it's where I'm at. So I will say that. Having said all that, I have found a couple of like interconnected problems in recent months and years with the OSR and with the stuff that's coming out. One of those issues I found is I find that there is, in the last few years especially, there's been a gold rush mentality around certain games. Morkborg, Mothership, OSE. And I get why. Those games are really big, they're really popular, and people want to create something for something that is big and popular because maybe they're trying to make money and so they want to like ride that wave. I totally get it, and I'm not here to like judge anyone for wanting to do that. But I think it creates a couple of problems, particularly when it comes to Morkborg. 
I'm honestly like so bored of Morkborg stuff. I can't even begin to tell you. I think that Morkborg was an awesome idea and is obviously very visually striking and cool. And I think it's especially cool that the creators of Morkborg opened it up to the community to create stuff for Morkborg and that Johan himself dives in there and helps people out with art. Like I love all that stuff. I think that's, yeah. it's really great for the community. It's really awesome. But I am personally just, I see that shade of yellow on a module. Or I see that typeface or I see the scribbly skeleton or whatever or I see the joke in the title that's like it's a pun of Morkborg my eyes roll in the back of my head at this point like I can't it's too much and it's not even that these things are necessarily bad it's just that I think that the Morkborgness of it is obscuring what might otherwise be really cool stuff Maybe people will discover it because it's something attached to Morkborg, but there's honestly so much stuff to wade through at this point. I think it's kind of hard to find the good stuff. I don't think it's as big a problem with OSC and Mothership, to be honest. I think Morkborg is the bigger villain, so to speak, in this in this instance. But I think that they have a sort of a similarish problem. Now, connected to that, a problem I'm finding in a lot of the stuff I'm looking at recently is I'm not seeing the point of view. A lot of these dungeons I'm looking at, a lot of the stuff I'm seeing... It just feels like riding a wave. It doesn't feel like a really striking point of view. I'm not getting authorial perspective in a lot of the stuff I'm reading. I think that that could be a problem of me not knowing where to find stuff, which is another problem. Yeah. (laughs) It used to be that the really cool stuff would end up on my desk, right? Like, even though I didn't know exactly where to look for it, it still ended up on my desk. I still encountered it. Now I have a really hard time finding the good stuff. And I don't think it's because it's not out there. I just think it's because we don't have all the same types of spaces and resources to find this stuff and to find the good stuff. In some sense, the community has never been more vibrant and prolific. And I think that's awesome. But in another sense, I do think that we're having like a certain flattening out of creativity and point of view from a lot of the adventure writing. And it's just something to be mindful of, I think. And that's why I I kind of threw out Wet Grandpa in my honorable mentions earlier, because Mm -hmm. I actually think White Grandpa is a great example of where I would love to see things go. This more bespoke point of view, a really particular visual style that's that's unique to that adventure. All of this is just to say that I sympathize with why everybody wants to make Morkborg stuff and wants to make Mothership stuff and wants to make OSC stuff. Like, I get it. But I do kind of wish that more writers would strike out on their own and try to yeah. like, try to create something wholly unique of their own. True. Well, that, yeah, I am sympathetic to that because there is, there's, I suppose that is the big problem for the old school scene and in general for role-playing games now is, I know we always bang on about Google Plus, but it was a place where you could find stuff that if you were stuff interested could, in. You could find things, yeah. Things yeah. Are, discoverability is a big problem now and not just for gaming, right? Because it's, uh, they, search engine results are, are rubbish now. Okay, like that's a, a, in every industry, um, it's just Google is useless, pretty much. It becomes hard to find things. Itch.io is not researchable, um, or when it is, it brings back again a flood of things. A total black hole. I have no idea. You know, I don't. I don't yeah. have to find anything. Try for RPG, I and you've, to you've, yeah. yeah, you've got to rely on recommendations, and, and that's tricky as well. Like people are busy; they don't have time to be recommending stuff to you all mm-hmm. the time. Right. Because at least, like, if something's started up for Mokborg, you know that it has a certain kind of. It's in mm-hmm. the penumbra of a certain kind of something, but. That said, it is kind of ironic to see the, you know, the uh, inheritors of a movement that was founded in part in response to a glut of D20 products (laughs) (laughs) just churning out uh, to see that sort of happening again. And as well, because I think the ones that are a bit rote, they, I'm sure, like you say, there are going to be some great things in the the Mokborg stable. But it's going to be hard to find them because I just sort of get frustrated. You know, I've just said, oh, I'd love to see yeah. the, I'd love to see these other genres. I want to see the, the adventure on the high seas. But what you often get, and this is particularly bad in mainstream gaming, is the sort of, oh, well, I've, I've done stats for this system for flintlock pistols and like speed ratings for different kinds of boat. I've done a pirate game. No, you haven't done a pirate game. You've made a list of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, and like, right. I mean, the, kick, the, big, the big budget Kickstarters for licensed IPs are particularly bad at this as well. Oh, like, there's, yeah. no, there's no design there. They just no. kind of, maybe they invent a new dice mechanic mm. to play around with, but it's not there for any purpose. It's just there to be different. Yeah. And look, here's a list of all the vehicles next to their official artwork from the video game or the movie. Here are some stats for them. Is there an adventure or any kind of like thing in this? And obviously there are exceptions, but there is a dispiriting kind of thing to see, especially when the gold rush works, right? When people fling money yeah, at the stuff, yeah. they talk about what a lovely book it is. And then... And then we never hear about it again. Like, yeah, yeah it looks great, but like, 
what about beyond that? Right. You know, and I guess maybe that's like our job or whatever, but like, you know, we can't do everything. And I'll put out these like calls on Twitter or wherever be like, you know, recommend some modules to me. And like, I'll be lucky if like 15 people reply. It's kind of dark in some ways. So yeah, the advantage of quote unquote, like big indies, you know, like Mork Borg and Mothership and all, and at all, or like Dolman would like, like the, the advantage of those things is that they are a place to go find things, but they are just one place to find one kind of thing. And in the case of Morkborg, I just think that it's such a glut that it's really, really difficult to find the good stuff. Or the only like perspective we're being given is just like irony. And I just, I don't know. It is not working for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> there are obviously things that are going to make themselves stand out and distinguish themselves. And there are things doing that. But just speaking kind of generally with the scene, that's kind of my feeling on it. Yeah. But yeah. Okay. Why don't we go to the next question? Yeah. Let's, let's talk about something nice. <laughs> this one's also from Muck Warmaker who I assume is quite nice despite his name or her name. What OSR projects, aside from this podcast, are you working on currently, Jason? I am presently working on a, well, it's nearly done, but I'm working on a trophy gold incursion called Heirs of Nagane. I don't want to say too much about it, but I have taken my favorite parts of Tomb of the Serpent Kings and Death Frost Doom and kind of combined them into one snaky palace crawl thing. And I think people are going to really love it. That yeah, sounds pretty good. Weirdly, I think I don't have that many OSR irons in the fire, but the ones I do have are all Stay Frosty related. So the armed taxi driver hack, uh, sort of inspired by Quarantine, mm. remember that? Yeah, mm. I've been fiddling around with. That's called Gridlock. That's fairly playable now. I also have a sort of Die Hard in a space hotel scenario. But nice. the one I'm most focusing on at the moment, because it's the hardest one to write, is a scenario for essentially like the Space Foreign Legion. But it's inspired by the film Beau Travail. Um, so it's like a garrison war film. Like you're mostly in training and on guard duty and, and things like that and going into town on R&R. And and that's what all the, the point crawl stuff is about. And then the grand finale is, you know, your final training mission against your rival squad. Mm. Partly inspired by the is it early 80s. There's a Soviet film called In the Zone of Special Attention, which is about these paratroopers like on a to them very important training mission (laughs) and uh, I I would describe it as in progress slowly because I keep uh, running up into problems of how to how to do it but yeah you know you talk about weird genres in OSR that's one for you so (laughs) and if you haven't seen Beau Travail by the way excellent film check it out nice kind of a related question or the other side of that question what OSR project from another creator are you most excited about right now Tom well this is a difficult one for me because I don't know what people are working like you know like the the communication seems to have broken mm. down a bit so um i've picked something that's already stuff that's already done <laughs> that i just haven't oh, looked okay. at yet <laughs> but yeah uh oh, well in that case my my thing i'm excited about is this bad kansas city i guess i've really been mm. prepping you know yeah doing the lonely fun stuff for that <laughs> oh yeah, yeah making pre-generated pcs and, and whatnot yeah how about for you I'm excited to dig into and run Amanda Lee Frank's trio of boat-based scenarios. You've got a job on the Garbage Barge, Uh Vampire Cruise, and Crush Depth Apparition. None of which are that adventure on the high seas boat-based thing I've been talking about. No, no, they're more claustrophobic. They're not not Uh, that, yeah. yeah. But they nevertheless look really, really cool. They do. I've got all three. I have run some of Garbage Barge, so yeah, that's. uh, I'm. I'm, I really want to do the other. The other two though, because. I like submarine stuff. <laughs> so, and cru- well, no, I don't like cruises. That's probably why I want to do the vampire one. So. Fantastic. Okay, our next question comes from Dr. DM2. I'm not sure if that's a medical doctor or just a PhD. Please write in and let us know. Congratulations, either way, well done. And the question is uh, what story or OSR systems are good for newbie GMs and players? And is it necessarily the same answer for both GMs and players? Why don't you take the OSR bit? Do I have to? <laughs> oh, no, oh, I will. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, I, I will actually, because no, the OSR bit, I think, is, is quite, is more straightforward to answer. Yeah. So first of all, to a degree, because of the way it was designed to be, OSR is, uh, is OSR, right? So you almost don't have to worry about it. That being said, for the more traditional end of it, I would recommend a Holmes D&D or the Blue Home Retro Clone. I feel like it's very, it's pretty clear, like easy to get into, to understand all the stuff that's written out quite clearly on the page descending armor class and all but then i think and some people don't consider it uh, full-on osr but i think i do think dungeon crawl classics is good i don't just think it i know it because i've been running for over a year now an open table dcc game and we have people come in 
and play role-playing games for the first time in their lives. And there are some features of DCC that make it particularly good for new players, specifically the zero-level funnel thing. Someone comes in for the first time, it'll mostly be existing characters, but they get given the sheet of four zero-level characters to go through anyway. And the reason that's great is because there are fewer things to learn and worry about on each character sheet. But the simple fact of having four of them means you get to be brave and do adventurous things, even though they're probably not going to work out, because if one of your characters falls off a pterodactyl or something, doesn't matter, you've got three more. And uh, mm. and actually, sheer numbers are useful sometimes. You can sort of be the hero by being four people mm -hmm. or whacking a monster with sticks yeah. and and, uh, and stuff. And then when you start to level them up, the, the classes in DCC are, are quite good in that they have sort of fun toys to play with. You know, the warriors do one thing, wizards do another but it's never really overwhelming. So you don't have to do any more homework than you particularly want to. Originally, I would not have said it was ideal for beginner GMs, but then I found out recently that the guy who's been GMing like every other week at this uh, thing for several months now, we're his first gaming group, basically. He hadn't oh, done this before. Okay. Yeah, Logical yeah. Classic. So it turns out it's fine. Um, so it yeah, seems DCC great. is good. So that's my answer. DCC, It generally speaking, I think DCC is the best, but if you really want to go... Old, old school. Old, then, old school. Then yeah. Blue Home or, or something like that. Anything that sort of sets out those rules in a slightly clearer way than uh, Gygax et al. managed to. Do you want to... I do have some story game ones, but you can you can talk a bit yeah, if you want, I'll, Jason. I'll yeah. kick off story games for <laughs> yeah. newbies. I Actually, I'm going to start with some anti-recommendations uh, for story oh, games. Yeah. Okay. Fiasco and Dread. Correct. Both <laughs> games <laughs> with incredible qualities in their own rights and they're very inf obviously very important and influ influential games and I know the authors and they have a lot of qualities. I think they are both particularly ill-suited for newbies. <laughs> fiasco because in my opinion fiasco unless you are playing with a table full of improv actors fiasco is insanely difficult to play. Yeah. It's probably the hardest role playing game to play if you are not a table full of improv actors. That's one. Dread I'm putting Dread as an anti-recommendation because Dread is so popular. Dread is so popular, and it is many, many people's first exposure to any game outside of Dungeons & Dragons. And I think that's really quite regrettable. I'm sure Epi loves it, but like it's regrettable from a newbie sense because <laughs> I think the game is really, really long on the tooth. It does so many cool things, and it's got so many cool ideas for its time, but I don't think it holds up in 2023. And so I don't like that it's a lot of people's first exposure to indie games outside of Dungeons & Dragons, or yeah. games outside of Dungeons yeah. & Dragons, right? Do Dread later on. Do Fiasco later on, right? Don't start with those. What I think you should start with is the party-style story games. The ones where you're not necessarily making a character. You're just really, really focused on like answering prompts and, and, doing, and doing collaborative storytelling like around a campfire. I think For the Queen by Alex Roberts is probably the best choice in this regard an outstanding game it's perfect for new players and so i would recommend that one i would go with another party style game like cheat your own adventure maybe final girl i personally really love that game it has a little bit of the same start getting started problem that fiasco has mm -hmm. but i think it's got a little more structure and more of a party game feel that makes it you know, playable in this regard so yeah i would go with one of the more party style story games just to kind of get a feel for some of these like basic story game ideas of collaborative world building and storytelling yeah, yeah. um if i would could jump in and recommend this the slightly more trad story game <laughs> mix if you know what i mean like so uh, i would say for new players cthulhu dark is excellent because there's one thing to it's a good choice yep, yep not ideal for new gms though because it's a lot of uh, thinking agreed. to do in the background yeah so. that's that's a tough game to gm yeah. Yeah, exactly and then the other one which uh, may surprise you i don't know is apocalypse world that is a surprising choice <laughs> but you see i i think it shouldn't be if you think about we're talking about newbie players I, again i don't know about gms but then maybe I'm not in the position to judge that because I was not a newbie uh, MC when I first read it. But the thing is, Apocalypse World confuses gamers who've played D&D &D and stuff. Do you know who it doesn't confuse? People who haven't played role-playing games. Uh, that's right? true, yeah. yeah. So uh, they just like, you know, it says, here's what you, when, when this happens, do this. Uh, I think it's true a lot of PBTA, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you just stop questioning everything and assuming that you need to read Vincent Baker's blog posts from like 2008 to understand it, actually, it's fine. It's all there in black and white. The reason I would recommend Apocalypse World over, for example, anything else, is that it, it kind of has everything you need for quite a, diverse range of i guess media or cultural backgrounds mm -hmm. so if you've got some people who want fantasy or science fiction it's got the weird stuff in there they can do that 
if you've got someone who mainly likes watching, I don't know, crime dramas and and soaps, mm -hmm. that's fine. They just play, they just focus on the, the non weird stuff. And the, a post apocalyptic setting is something everyone can grasp quite easily because it's where you live, but worse. Uh, yeah, and it sort of it drives itself. You know, you do have to do prep, but not of the sort of drawing a dungeon kind. Yeah, overall, I th especially for players. So you know, I can't really vouch for it for the MC because. I haven't been able to do a controlled experiment on it, you know. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, certainly for players, like I found that as, as a first game, especially if they're first-time adult players, of course, it's just a good choice because it provides all the tools that you need, and you know, you just again, you just need the playbook in front of you. That's everything you need. So yeah, Apocalypse World. Fantastic. Let's go to our next question by Yepa, which is, what's the one system nobody plays anymore, but they should. Uh, my answer to this is the Gold Rush so Games niche. version so of yeah, yeah, the Gold Rush Games version of Asagi Ujimbo, designed by Greg Stoltz in I think nineteen ninety eight. Mm -hmm. Because is it, this is like not really answering the question because the any more suggests that many people played it in the past and that is not yeah, true. Exactly. It's, right, yeah. it's in other ones it sort of fell into a publishing hole like the publisher folded shortly after it came out and all that kind of thing. But it has so much to recommend it and I enjoy it so much I've even developed a kind of retro clone of it which you will be able to read uh, for yourself even if you're not on my Patreon uh, soon enough. I just really like it. I think uh, I won't go into too much detail about it but basically it's uh, uh, something you should go and, and read up on if you can. Not to be confused with the slightly more complicated Sanguine, I think, publishing version that came out later. Uh, this one's pretty straightforward, uh, has a cool little samurai dueling mechanic in it, and, and it's about little rabbits and bears and pigs and stuff going around historical Japan being samurai. So, yeah, I like it. I've run it quite a few times, did a whole campaign of it. I think people would enjoy it if they if they got the chance to try it. How about you? I'm going to go with... I'm going to go with Dogs in the Vineyard and Inspectors. Ah, good call. Dogs in the Vineyard is... Well, so for one thing, we should point out that the creator, Vincent Baker, has kind of disowned Dogs in the Vineyard for reasons that I don't agree with, but they're his reasons and I respect that. But I think that the game is incredible. Mechanically, it's not incredible. Uh, it actually is early story game stuff and mechanically it has... I, I think Vincent improved on the ideas in subsequent games that are in Dogs in the Vineyard, but it's nevertheless a really unique mechanic, sort of inspired by poker using dice, and it's pretty cool just to experience as a sort of, kind of like the, the Jenga Tower in Dread. Not perfect, but it's neat that it exists, and people should try it. But I actually think the setting of Dogs in the Vineyard is great. The vibes are fucking impeccable. Yeah, yeah. You want to talk about a game with a perspective, with a point of view, man, Dogs in the Vineyard has a point of view. And I find it really sad that for whatever reason, it's been shuffled to the sidelines of like our consciousness and the hobby. For There's different reasons for that. But I wish that wasn't the case. I think it's a piece of art that people should be enjoying. Inspectors, not for the same reasons, but I, Inspectors, I think, is one of those games that it was doing something really cool and interesting mechanically back in the day. It's this Ghostbusters reality show game. It was doing so many cool things in terms of using your reality show confessional to sort of change the yeah, narrative, so to change the fiction. So, so yeah. good. It's got like a fun character creation process, which is like a job interview with this group inspectors, your local branch of inspectors. It's just a lot of fun. I've always had great, great fun with it. And um, I wish people would, would play it. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned inspectors because it's uh, just the other, I've never played it. And just the other day I was thinking, oh, I should play inspectors. And then I forgot about it. Uh, but now I'm going to, I'm going to do yeah, it. It's in yeah, podcast give, give it form. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll play it. Seems fun. All right, our next question comes from Andy. Andy writes, what are the salient lessons from old school modules that apply today? Are they just a relic of the past or can modern games still learn something from them? Hmm, it's a broad question and there are so many potential answers, I think. But I think the thing that comes to mind for me is when you're reading these older modules, you can tell that these modules were created directly from the table of the author. The author plainly created this scenario for their game table and has run it a bunch or has run it enough to where they now want to sort of formalize it in text or they get invited by a publisher to do that. You can see it. You can see that they know where the pitfalls are. They know how to give GMs advice on what to, what to look out for and what to do what here and there. And I'm not sure that's really happening nowadays. I'm not sure that modules and adventures are coming up directly from table play. I'm not convinced that's happening. 
And I think it has a positive benefit for the final product. Now, those older modules are not perfect and they're way too wordy and there's certainly a lot of things that we should discard from that time. But one thing that I think was part of adventure writing culture back then is, you know what, this is something me and my friends have been doing. And now it's something that I'm sharing with you. And I just don't get that sense in modern day adventure writing. I guess that kind of design has moved to uh, blogs and things where someone will just do a poster. But we tried this uh, last week. Yeah, and it was pretty cool. Yeah, and, but, yeah. but that's not something you can really access when you're at the table. I suppose you could open it on your phone at the table. But yeah, it's a, it's a shame. I, I think you can tell. You're right. You can sort of tell. They just, yeah, you can tell. Yeah. Yeah. Like things that you don't think could be relevant. And then it turns mm -hmm. out it is. And it's because it happened to them. And I suppose that is the thing to learn, I suppose, is it's one thing to have a cool idea. Like, for example, you might want to uh, write a Stay Frosty scenario based on the movie Bo Trevi and other Garrison, uh, <laughs> Garrison films, but like that's not enough. When I get that to a roughly playable state, I'm going to have to go play it and see if any of it works and maybe throw it all away. Because it's not as hard to publish now as it used to be, you can throw any old thing onto drive through RPG, and many people do. You've got to resist. You've got to give yourself barriers. You know? You've got to give yourself challenges. These guys were... Was it photostatting things onto blue paper and like they couldn't have more than 16 pages? And uh, I, I think to some degree, the fact that it's quite easy to throw up unfinished work and, and start charging 99 cents for it mm -hmm. is a bit of a problem as well. So I think, yeah, constraint, that might be a thing to learn from old school modules. Yeah. 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 Anyway, that's we've made it depressing again, Jason. Let's, uh, no, we'll, we'll, let's go, we'll, go to a, we'll go to a nicer one. All right. This one's from Necrograntic. If you could delete one entry in your Appendix N to enjoy again for the first time, what would it be? I know what mine would be, but do you, do you have a thought? Oh, here? From the Appendix N, man, no, I don't. Uh. I think they mean like your own Appendix N, like your own personal Appendix N. Oh, okay. Yeah, like your favorite yeah. books and movies and stuff that you would. That's that's why I interpreted the question anyway. Oh, okay. Well, I not from like I... the actual Appendix N. <laughs> no, is that because <laughs> no, I, pro I, wondering, yeah, I, I probably thinking... never looked at any of those things. So, <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. Oh, okay. Wait, you, you do your one. I still need to think okay. a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Mine is definitely Things We Lost in the Fire, a book by Mariana Enriquez. That book, it's a sort of Lovecraftian horror anthology all set in, I believe, Argentina. The stories have no connection to each other until they do at the end. It is so powerfully written. It's so cool. The storytelling is incredible. It's genuinely horrifying and scary. I can't say that like a lot of cosmic horror is legit scary as you're reading it. It's mostly just kind of weird and cool at best. But this is like proper scary. And it has a message. It has a point of view. I keep saying point of view to this episode, but that's that's my, it's my theme for today. It's a remarkable work. And in the last year or so, it's been very, very influential on my own creative work. And I would love to be able to experience it anew and have those same creative neurons firing off again. Yeah, I've realized what mine is, I think. And it is the novel If on a Winter's Night a Traveler by Italo Calvino. Mainly because it has an absolute killer ending. And by the way, do not, do not be tempted upon hearing me say this to go to your bookstore and flip to the end. It won't work. You've got to read the whole thing. Read the whole thing. Yeah. If on a winter's night, a traveler by Italo Calvino, because, you know, it, it's great to read a second time, but you'll never get the first time with that ending again. So, yeah. Fantastic. And why don't we go ahead and just end with this question that's kind of kind of personal to the two of us. Okay. Which is, how often do you two, meeting you and I, right? <laughs> but how often have we played in each other's games? And do you each have a favorite moment from the shared table? Well, and the answer, this is from Into Bats. Into Bats, we don't get to play together very often. Increasingly and frequently, I would say. Yeah, 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 yeah. We did play that French game recently. Uh, what was that yeah, one? Yeah, Americana, yeah. That's right. That was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that French game, Americana. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we played that. <laughs> We've determined yeah. that it's not really appropriate for show coverage. Um, no, it, no, no. It, it's structure it's, and, and stuff. It just isn't, it's just old school. Doesn't quite stuff, fit. But it was yeah. good. It was good. It was I fun. Mean, yeah. If, you're yeah. Fr if you read French, yeah, I think the first chapter is super railroady, but it's mm. kind of worth it because it pays off later. It's that kind of scenario. Yeah. We've played a couple of your games, or we've definitely played Melandros together. Sure. Which that's, yeah. that's on a podcast. You can all go listen to that. Mm -hmm. Actually, speaking of podcasts, so, listeners, the way Tom and I met originally was Tom was a guest on 
our editor, Rich Rogers, is uh, the, the Frog Show. What was the name of the, the frog? frog? Uh, Dr. Tom the Frog. Dr. Right. Tom the Frog. That's right. Yeah. Where basically a puppet frog relentlessly makes puns while the game designer guest tries to sell their game, right? And Tom was on talking about some translations of Brazilian games that he'd done. Yeah. This is the first time I'd seen Tom on anything. And I made kind of a joke. Uh, I made, well, not a joke. I mean, I guess I meant it, but, but I, in a joking way. On our Slack at the time, I was like, I was like, wow, I think Tom is like the handsomest person in tabletop role-playing games. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and we had kind of a laugh about that. But also, I consider myself a flawless judge of character in most, well, not completely Which, flawless, but was, pretty flawless judge okay. of character. Okay. Okay. Pretty good judge of character. And I thought that, I was like, I want to do something with Tom. I like his vibe. I think we could do something together. And we did this Monster of the Week actual play for our, mm. our now dead podcast called Comic Strip AP. An idea, frankly, that was way ahead of its time. Yeah. Tragically under-listened to. Yeah, under-listened to. Never yeah. caught on because it was way ahead of its time. But it was really good. Like, from a production standpoint, Comic Strip AP was amazing. Mm. But basically, a GM and a player pair would get together and do an actual play in, like, 10 or 15-minute installments. And we did one of Monster of the Week. It, the scenario was like Suspiria meets it's 1960s like to catch a thief. caper yeah. movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was really good. fun. And yeah, that was the first time that you and I were working on something together. Yeah. Yeah. It was, Man, it was, that was good that was, that was, that was, It was good fun. I composed original music for that, you know? You did. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, it's, it, there was a lot of work went into way, it. it way was really too much good. effort for yeah. the, <laughs> what we got out of it. The yeah. Listeners, but, you uh, should go yeah. find it, though. It's really, really good. I think the whole series in total is maybe like two hours long or something like that. Yeah, something like and that. it's totally worth a listen. Like, yeah. go listen to it. But yeah, it's an earlier version of Tom and I. But we are we were definitely firing on all cylinders at yeah. the time. Like we were and uh, what, what do we do sort of playing? I think you ran that series of I never remember the name of your the town that you were setting all your horror games in at the time. But I played like I two know. out of three linked through dark scenarios. And it was in this one town. Like, it was one in the sixties. It was one in the sixties of like a sort of arts theater festival. Oh 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 oh! You oh the, the Mercy Falls. Mercy Falls, Stuff. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I was, that I was, was from another sort of... podcast AP, yeah yeah, 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 my Monster Hearts. But then I did these like spin-off games. Exactly, yeah. So Hearts. I was in some of the yeah. spin-offs. That was oh, good. Okay, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not enough yeah. though. We should play more together. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we should do. Definitely should. The highlight, I think, for me is just uh, everything in that Melandros game, but especially you. That was a and, good. Uh, that was good. Who was it? Who was playing the aristocrat character? Who was your landlord? That was always. Uh, I don't remember who else was in that game. Oh, David was in that something. game. I remember. It was me, it was David. Was it Tyler Jimmy. was in there? And... Oh, yeah. Oh, Tyler was in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was really great. You had an NPC in that that was so good. I still think about that NPC all the time. <laughs> Is that the, the, sort of the Spanish? The Spanish <laughs> yeah. the aristocrat guy. Yeah, yeah, he was great. Okay. Yeah, good times. Listeners, that was episode 100 of Fear of a Black Dragon. We hope you enjoyed us reminiscing and rambling <laughs> and uh, ranting in some cases. This has been a lot of fun. I want to thank you all, listeners, for taking this journey with us. If you've been here since episode one, we're so grateful. If you've just joined us, that's awesome, too. Tom and I do this, and Rich, we do this because we love it, uh, because we enjoy getting together and talking about games. It gives us a good excuse to try new adventures, try new things, and it's all really great. I do want to take a moment, listeners, to implore you, to plead with you even, to please go support the gauntlet on Patreon. I happen to know for a fact that only a very small percentage of you support us on Patreon, and I would love to see more people do it. Obviously, the money is important because we have to pay our bills. That's an important part of this process. But also, I like to know that you all are excited for what we're doing and this is a way to show that you are part of the team and that you're really excited about what we're doing and to encourage us to do it more please consider it consider coming off the sidelines and helping us out on patreon it's patreon.com forward slash gauntlet we're gonna keep doing this and we love doing it but we would love to have you on board with us in that way so you should think about it tom thanks for 100 episodes Buddy. Yeah, Jason, thank you too. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't feel doesn't feel like it's been that many years. Um, I mean, it's it has been a long time. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah. Well, you know. It's uh, yeah, the years have flown by. Um, mm. <laughs> maybe not for listeners waiting uh, between Patiently some of our lulls. Episode, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Sorry, guys, it takes a lot of work, but we do appreciate your patience and the fact that you um, respond so warmly and well, sometimes. Okay, mostly warmly. Mostly warmly, uh, yeah. To, uh, uh, only to one the... time not, and that was Leisure Domain. Let's just say it. The Leisure Domain yeah, episode Leisure is Domain the one episode. where we... That was the... 
the one time we had some pretty bad interactions yeah. with listeners but you know, overall okay. it's been a very overall, positive very process yeah. yeah and yeah. thanks of course to rich our excellent editor mm-hmm. no no vaguely punning adjective this time he's just excellent <laughs> Best in the biz when it comes to editing role playing game podcasts. Best in the biz by a lot. Sure. Yeah, he's not going to edit any of this, but is he? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. Thanks yeah. so much, everybody. Bye. Bye bye.